Hello everyone, this is Dr. West here. Welcome to our next lecture. We are going to be talking about movement in this lecture. And what you're going to see, hopefully, is that it's going to build on our last lecture. As I sort of previewed for you at the beginning of the last lecture, these two systems sort of work almost in an exact opposite pattern. So the somatosensory system is what you guys heard about in the very last lecture. And again, it followed the traditional sensory pattern, right? So you had a receptor, a receptor, actually with several different kinds of receptors all throughout the skin and other places in the body. And they collected all of the information, ultimately sending that information to the brain. Um, you heard there were several different pathways up the spinal cord. Um, eventually that information reached the thalamus. Eventually, the thalamus sent that information to the primary somatosensory cortex. And then, as you heard with other sensory systems, there's secondary cortex and association cortex. And the neat thing that we talked about with movement is that it sort of runs the opposite direction. That movement starts in a prim primary movement area in the brain. And it's, uh, or excuse me, it starts with association areas in the brain, right? Because it's putting together all of the different pieces of incoming information, plus memories, plus a bunch of other stuff. And then you decide, wait, I need to make a movement or I want to make a movement and this is the exact movement I want to make and this is how I want to do it, right? It probably doesn't even take you that long to make the decision as it does to actually describe that you're wanting to do it. But nonetheless, you want to make a movement. And so then you send that information from the association areas to the secondary areas and the primary areas, right? And then eventually that information is going to be then sent back down right, to some very specific nuclei in the brainstem, and then ultimately through the spinal cord and back out to the body so that it can send specific messages to specific muscles to help you activate those muscles in exactly the right way to then pull on the bones to go back to unit one, right, because you can't, a muscle by itself doesn't do anything but contract, so it has to be able to contract or relax and move and pull on the appropriate bones to actually move you around so that you can do the exact movement that you want to do. So that's what this lecture is going to pick up on. You're going to hear Dr. Bennett kind of uh, review that as well. You're also going to hear me break in a few times. Uh, this, this particular uh, lecture is very near and dear to me, and you will hear me why, uh, to explain that why in just a few minutes um, with the next time that I break in to this chapter and discuss things. So nonetheless, I will see you guys in a few and uh, enjoy. We're going to talk about movement. This is a continuation of uh, chapter 11. The last time we talked about somatosensory, we talked about how the information comes in from the receptors, the thalamus, to the primary, secondary, association cortex. So very similar to all the other senses that we talked about previously. And I did mention, and now we're going to talk about how movement uses the same exact kind of process, except for it's in the opposite direction. So you start with the association cortex sending information to the prefrontal cortex uh, to start creating motor programs, and then it goes into the secondary and primary, then it goes through the brain stem and into the muscles for actually um, communicating or actually caught having the movement occur. Seen this picture tons of times, just driving it at home, information coming in is afferent, it's arriving, information moving out or exiting is efferent, and the motor system is efferent, right? Because it's always controlling, it's the nervous system controlling the periphery. Now, last time we talked a little bit about the homunculus, we didn't get a lot into it because I like to drop that idea there, um, and then I like to revisit it here so that we can see there are two homunculi. Uh, there's the sensory one and there's the motor one. The one you saw before was the sensory. So we're gonna talk about how the sensory and the motor one are, they're very actually similar when you look at it and we look at the way the brain and the topographic representation on the brain occurs. Specific areas of the brain are associated with, for the sensory system, it's the sense information coming in from that area to touch the somatosensory receptors that are then processed there. And for the motor cortex, it's the places that have control over those areas. The motor homunculus lines the central sulcus in the frontal lobe. Again, different areas of the body are represented, and we did find this out through uh, open uh, awake. Individuals were awake when they had surgery, and they stimulated different areas of the brain, and people could, their fingers would twitch, or their legs would twitch, or move. Uh, so this was how we literally found it out through this type of process. So here again, just showing you, the this is the sensory, looking at the homunculus here, you can see the different areas that are sending information to be processed. Over here is the motor cortex, the motor homunculus. 
So again, mapping on similar areas to the face is in that same general area where you're bringing information in versus controlling it. So the humuncular man, there are two. There's the one for the somatosensory, which is representing the places throughout our body where most of our sensory information is focused. And then we also have the motor cortex or motor homunculi, where the size of that body portion is representative about how much of our brain is dedicated to processing that information. So they look distorted. There are areas that are smaller and areas that are larger. So that right there is the somatosensory homunculi, the information coming in. We rely on our hands for a lot of information. And then our mouth is another big area and our eyes. This is the motor homunculus. You can see that our hand and our mouth, still a lot of our brain is dedicated towards it, but you can see there are other stronger, more important places like the legs and the trunk and the eyes aren't overwhelmingly large, that kind of thing. So there you go. A little creepy looking, I get it. If you've ever used a map on your cell phone to get you from place A to place B, you're familiar with the idea that a map is simply a representation of some sort of area that actually exists in the real world. So a map on your cell phone is a digital map of an actual place somewhere in the world. Similar to this digital roadmap, your brain also has a map of your body. And this map is something known as the somatosensory homunculus. The somatosensory homunculus is basically a map of your body in your brain. And let me go into this because it is a little bit confusing conceptually at first. So what I've drawn over here is a picture of the brain. Let's just focus in on this pink area over here. This pink area is something known as the cortex. And this region that I shaded in in orange over here is a specialized part of your brain that receives sensory input from your entire body. So whenever you feel pain or whenever you feel some sort of heat anywhere in your body, all this information is actually sent through the spinal cord into the brain and it all ends up over here in this one part of the cortex. And this part of the cortex is known as the sensory strip. So let me just clean this up a little bit. So if we were to actually take a cross-sectional look at the sensory strip, so if we cut the brain just right down the middle and kind of looked at it this way, what we would see would be this large orange structure that I drew here. So this orange structure is basically just the sensory strip and we're looking at it this way if we cut it right down the middle. And so as I mentioned before, this, this sensory strip contains a somatosensory homunculus. And the somatosensory homunculus is basically a map of the body and the brain. And what I mean by this is that information that comes from your hand to the brain will all end up in one part of the sensory strip. So information from your finger, will actually come over here. Information from these fingers will come over here. Information from the palm of your hand will come over here. Information from your wrist will actually end up over here in the sensory strip. And similarly, if we were getting information from your foot, the information from your foot would all synapse over here in this part of the cortex and information from your toes would synapse over here. So you get the idea. Basically information from various parts of the body will come into the brain hit the sensory strip, and it'll always go to one part of that sensory strip. So this is your face over here. So this would be the face. And so information from the lips would come right here. Information from the eyes would go over here and so on. So basically the sensory strip always receives information from different parts of the body. And that information will always go to one part of the sensory strip. So let me again, clean this up a little. If this is still a little confusing, let me try explaining it a different way. So let's imagine that there was a brain tumor right over here. This brain tumor would kind of look like this. It would basically be in this region of the brain. And so in order to figure out what part of the brain is tumor and what part of the brain is normal, neurosurgeons can actually go in with an electrode and touch different parts of the cortex. So they can actually come in and touch this part of the cortex and touch this part of the cortex. And this electrode will actually cause the cells that it touches to stimulate. And so in some cases, the surgery can actually be conducted on patients that are awake. And so if a surgeon touches this part of the cortex, patients can actually say, oh, if it, I feel as if somebody is touching my wrist. And if the surgeon touches this part of the cortex, people might say, oh, I feel somebody touching my forehead or my eye. 
So depending on what part of the cortex the surgeon places his electrode, the patient will get a sensation of some part of his or her body being touched. The reason that surgeons do this is to make sure that they aren't removing parts of the cortex that are involved in sensation because if the surgeon were to remove this part of the cortex, the patient would no longer have any feeling in the wrist or in the forearm. So they need to make sure that the part of the cortex that they're removing is not involved in sensation, otherwise the patient would actually lose sensation. Similarly, if the surgeon removed this part of the cortex, the patient would lose sensation in the lips because that this part of the cortex actually receives input from the lips. So let me again clean this up just to go over everything one last time. So the sensory homunculus basically maps out the body in the brain. So as information comes to the brain from different parts of the body, information from the hand will all synapse in this region of the cortex. Information from the face will synapse in this region. Information from the feet will synapse in this region. And so what this effectively creates is a topological map of the entire body in this strip of cortex. And this topological representation of the body in the cortex is what's known as the somatosensory homunculus. This video introduces uh, Parkinson's disease, and it's a, um, done by Michael J. Fox and his foundation. If you don't know much about Parkinson's and, um, or know anybody who's really been affected by it, it's a great video to watch to help you understand how important movement and smooth movement is and then how the loss of it wreaks havoc um, psychologically. And then, so go watch it. Hello again, Dr. West here. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit before I showed you this video about why this particular topic and lecture is so important to me and actually why I didn't re-record the entire lecture. Um, it's a little bit difficult for me to get through this entire lecture without getting a little bit emotional. So a couple years ago now, my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, for a lot of you, you may not know, I used to be a full-time professor at the University of North Carolina Charlotte. In fact, I was the undergraduate coordinator there uh, loved that position. I loved working with the students. I loved doing the academic advising side of things. And I ended up having to make a pretty difficult decision um, because I live down in South Carolina to actually uh, quit working up there at UNC Charlotte and take a position down here at Winthrop a little closer to home. Um, even though, again, I still do some adjunct work for, for you guys up at UNC Charlotte. Um, but anyway, one of the big determining factors of why I did that was actually because I knew I was going to need to ultimately provide a lot more support and help for my dad um, and his primary caregiver, which is my mother, um, as his uh, disease progressed and as he was going to need more and more support for his motor movements and things. Um, one of those forms of support has actually come in the form of moving them into our home. Um, so again, you're going to see, and I like, I like some of these videos that, that we've chosen to show you guys, that Parkinson's is definitely a motor disorder, which is obviously why we're bringing it up in this particular unit. Um, and it's really neat, especially later on, Dr. Bennett does a really nice job of explaining um, exactly how Parkinson's disrupts the brain and then that ultimately disrupts the motor movements. But it isn't just a motor issue. Ultimately, it can become very much... Uh, a psychological issue as well. It can have secondary effects. Um, depression is a big one that happens in a lot of Parkinson's patients because they know what they should be able to do. They know what they've been able to do in the past and they know that they can't do that anymore. And that's sort of the phase that my father is at. Um, he was in the United States Marine Corps. And as you can imagine, not being able to do certain things anymore is, is extra hard for somebody who was extra active um, as you can imagine, a United States Marine would be. Anyway, nonetheless, that's my little personal connection. And, and the only reason I'm even telling you that, honestly, is just because research has shown that if you can make it real, if you can make it connected with something that's real, you're going to remember it more. And so I thought maybe sharing my story about how it's personal to me, that, that understanding and learning how motor movements work, um, I mean, yeah, I had to learn all this in graduate school and all that stuff, but I, I 
almost restudied it and had to learn it extra and differently when I was learning again how to care for my father and what kinds of things we would need and how we might need to prepare our home differently um, to make sure our house was going to be as safe as possible for him and things like that. I had to kind of take another look about, okay, what is going on in the brain? What is going to be different for his life? How is his ability going to change? And then what could we do to make sure our home um, is set up for that? Nonetheless, again, that's just my little personal connection to this particular lecture. Um, now let's, let's jump into this video. I was 29 when I found out I had Parkinson's disease. I soon learned that each patient has their own version of Parkinson's, their own story to tell. I was diagnosed in 2006. It was two weeks after my 39th birthday. <laughs> that just came across me like, where did this come from? Why me? I had noticed a um, few years prior that I wasn't smelling things as clearly. And I started off just kind of noticing a kind of a kink in my arm uh, before I could just stop it. But then it came to a point where the thing that stops it, it wasn't there anymore. I was writing thank you notes to people for my 50th birthday party, and I would start the note, the letters would get smaller and smaller, and sooner or later, they wouldn't, the hand wouldn't move. And so I said, there's definitely something going on here. About two years ago, December, I just had problems running. Like, my right leg just didn't keep up with the left leg. And uh, I sort of blew it off, and then uh, my husband saw me running, and he said, what's wrong with you? And it's like I had a stroke. It was like you had a stroke, or you did have a stroke? No, I didn't. We were on vacation, so when we got back, I finally went to the doctor. I, I had a really strong hand tremor, and I went to Portland, and kind of hit it for a while, and finally I was diagnosed. And I remember when you came out and told the world that you had Parkinson's. I just thought it was just um, a disease that made you shake. That's the only thing I knew about it. So how, what was the reaction of your family? Well, I, I prepared my wife first and wanted her to become comfortable with it. So I, I kept it to myself my first year and I dropped hints and I brought up alerts and, and, I, and I didn't directly um, tell her what the story was. In our family, we always swept things under the rug. After you would come out with an article about going public with it, my sister started asking me questions. This was the first out of eight siblings that had really asked me about it. And because I was the swimmer of the family, I was, went to college on a scholarship, and I just felt with my family that I was the loser with the disease. The number one thing that the doctors tell you is don't stress out. How can you tell me not to stress out? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's impossible. I mean, you don't get to decide at the moment you, you know, have Parkinson's whether you're going through family issues. I had depression, and then I had the ending of a marriage, and then I had the Parkinson's all at once. Mm -hmm. It all hit at once. Bam. The big things, I mean, I'm, I'm up for the challenge that, that it takes to, to accomplish some things. Mm -hmm. It's the little things like putting cup on a saucer, yeah. it, it just drive me absolutely insane. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't stop, except, that, you know, when you're sleeping. Yeah. I wish we could somehow sleepwalk. And, and you, you, you dream when you're awake. Yeah. So much of what you do is, is precise and about balance and about a certain order in a way. Mm -hmm. And then to have Parkinson's, it seems like it kind of throws all that out of the window. It gets rough, like the, the drawing is is particular because there's certain details you want to draw on. And, and now it's like, it's rather hard to keep that flowing and it's kind of discouraging. I can see that frustration, not being able to do what, you, what you've done it to that point. See that, how did that manifest itself in your relationships and in your, and in your other life? Well, I think I, what happened is, I felt like I had to do everything now. And so, like I, so I, I sort of went on the, extreme of exercising just because I want to get it all in 
training's not going well. Like I developed a tendonitis because my gait's so odd. I have like this galloping gait. I've fallen a couple times. So this will be my last marathon. When you're playing and you have injuries, you know that you can recover from, you'll be all right, you'll be back on the court. If there's something that you can't fix, in your mind, you tend to think that you're weak. And I had to lose that because I really missed out on being able to spend some good time with these guys over the past few years because I was too nervous to go into the locker room because I didn't want the young guy seeing my hand shake. Once you get past the idea that you did something to deserve this or, or that if you're symptomatic, it's reflective of some kind of flaw, it's not. It's just a pure scientific thing. You're, you're, in, you're in the pharmaceutical business, right? Yes. And I always thought through hard work and and perseverance that, that we would get the answers, and the answers are elusive. Acceptance doesn't mean resignation. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can accept it and then endeavor to change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's no escaping it. You have to accept it. For me, for me, it hasn't just all, all at once come and say, okay, I accept it. I don't know if this happened with you, but Sometimes I think I don't have it. <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I convince myself that, man, this, you know, even though it's tremoring, well, maybe it's something else. I, you know, my mind plays tricks on me sometimes, and then I had to look at myself and be, you got it, you know. I guess it took me a few years to say, okay, I was given this and I was given it for a reason. And I can either sit and sulk and be a victim or take this and run with it. I finally let the NBA go. I don't need to be in the NBA. I, I don't need to be that player. I'm Brian Grant. I'm not Brian Grant the player, you know. I'm Brian Grant the dad, the friend. You know, what you're doing is just like the it's, the, it's so heroic, it's so amazing, you know, to be able to get people the tools and the financing to use their minds to, to zero in on the, the problem. I mean, I really knew nothing about your foundation until I got diagnosed and then, you know, I was reading about it, and it, you know, I just really like the uh, the work you're doing with the research and working with the collaboration. I mean, it's really very exciting. If there's a possible cure, I will do whatever I can for it. And that's what I've learned to do is to let people come in and help. Whereas before, I was all about me, and I can fix it. I can do this on my own, and now I know that I can. I know that I do have to let these people come in and help. Right. I truly think I do have a mission, and. I'm glad it's, it's on your path. There are over one million people living with Parkinson's in the United States. The cure may seem elusive, but we're not giving up. We face Parkinson's head on, with purpose re-examined and new dreams to pursue. We have resolved to fight this disease. And with perseverance, we will keep pushing ahead. We may each have our own individual Parkinson's, but we all share one thing in common. Hope. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, now, when we talk about motor control and the different pieces of the brain that play a role, there's the cerebrum, the forebrain, Conscious control, that's the frontal lobe primarily. You have the brain stem, which controls automatic and the, and the spinal cord. Both of those control automatic movements. Things like um, heart rate, breathing rate, those types of things. We can see changes when there are lesions or places that there are, um, are defects or injuries that occur in the brain stem and the spinal cord. And then the forebrain can no longer create the movement, but they it can it can no longer communicate to have the movement occur, but it can still create patterns. And this is because people can verbalize them. There are uh, two other places that are important, the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. And we're gonna talk about these again, but the basal ganglia is responsible for helping us have smooth and appropriate force with our grasping and, and movement. The cerebellum helps us regulate timing and accuracy and helps us actually make adjustments. This is one of the reasons why when people are highly intoxicated on alcohol, there are a lot of receptors for alcohol in the cerebellum, and this is why motor control is off and why we get sloppy and we drop things or we lose our balance and those types of things, because that area of the brain is, is highly affected by the effects of alcohol. One of the things we understand about movement is that it's a very intricate series of 
organize movements. You want to get that coffee cup, you want to get that wine glass, you want to get that glass of water, whatever, it doesn't matter, whatever you're reaching for. We visually identify it and we see the target. Then the frontal lobe starts to think about what are the steps in which I need to make the arm move to get to the glass and then grasp it and then bring it back, right? So there's all these series of things that we don't have to think about, which is great if you're a fully functional human being. You don't have to think very discreetly about each step of getting your hand from the side of your, you know, on, on your leg to picking up that glass and then bringing it to your mouth. It's usually just a simple flow because we've been moving for, we've been trained. Our, our brain interacts really well this way. The information is constantly being sent between the somatosensory. Once you get to that glass, you feel, you get the input, oh, I've made it, excellent, now I can grasp it and I can pick it up. If you don't grasp it enough, your hand will slide off, right? Or if you grasp it too hard, depending on what it is, it's a paper cup, you could crush it and then all the liquid would end up everywhere. We don't think about this. Our body, we have just figured out how to manipulate these things so that we can get our goal, which is getting that cup to our mouth. And it's a constant communication between the somatosensory and the movement. Are you getting there? Have you gotten there? Have you gotten close enough to the cup? All that kind of stuff. So Lashley in the 1950s started to figure out and start to tease apart how do we actually make all of this concerted, well-orchestrated movements. And it turns out that as he was going through and studying, and this was some of this was in animal work, but looking at how activation occurs and where you can interrupt them, based on all of his work, he found that there seemed to be sequences that were put in place and that when it was put in place and organized well, there was this nice smooth transition. However, there were times when these sequences were not, and those were things that he was causing changes in the frontal lobe of rodents to interfere with how well these sequences were being created. A motor sequence is that pre-programming by the brain, and then the there seems to be there are three primary areas of the frontal lobe that seem to play a major role. There's the prefrontal cortex, and that's where a lot of the association information is being dumped in, and it's creating and planning. So its job is to put together what is going to be the complex behavior we want. Then the premotor cortex starts to produce appropriate complex movement sequences to get you there. And then the primary motor cortex is responsible for taking that information from the premotor and sending it off to the spinal cord to then be shared with the muscles so they can interact and create the outcome. And here's a quick picture so you can see those pieces. Again, prefrontal cortex creates the ideas about what you want to do. The premotor starts to organize them so that you're not grasping before you get to the cup. And then the motor cortex is actually sending the information so that it can actually be acted out. Now the brainstem seems to play a really important role in one, communicating the information, but it also has the ability to, it seems to adapt based on a species behavior. This is like why um, rodents don't hiss, uh, cats hiss, or rodents, cats don't bark, right? These are specific types of behaviors or actions that unfold. And this seems to be driven by piece, the structures that go on, the signals that go on from the brainstem. It also is responsible for any of those type of adaptive movements. For like humans, when we went from being a quadruped to biped, there was, there was a change in the way our bodies sent information. We no longer relied on our hands for balance and for moving because we could do it standing up on our hind legs. There are cases where um, the spinal cord results in injury. There are um, quadriplegic, quadriplegics, which are individuals who have lost sensation and control of their legs and arms. And there's a paraplegia, which is paralysis or loss, typically only in the legs, the lower legs. Um, and those are, at this point, uh, there is, are few clinical trials going on where individuals, by using stem cells, have started to regain their sensation. Uh, there was a, just a report recently uh, that there were some spinal um, stem cells inserted into the spinal cord of a quadriplege um, at the site of injury and uh, at one of the upper sites of injury. And the individual has started to feel again in their hands and have some movement in his fingers. It came back slowly and he has gone through physical therapy and is all the way at the point where he can be a functional paraplegic, meaning he is in a wheelchair, but he has complete control over his arms and his upper body. So he can live alone independently 
Um, and in the story that was about it, it was just talking about how he felt such independence and how grateful he was to be part of this. Now, one of the things we don't know is, is this a permanent change? Have the stem cells that came in and grew and helped bridge over the damage, are they going to be sustained? And that's a question that they don't know. It's been a, a very recent um, publication. So I know this slide actually says we talk about reflexes and we really don't spend a lot of time on reflexes. They are responsible. Reflexes are things that doctors use to check on the nervous system and its functionality. This is where you're sitting on a, a doctor's table and he hits your knee and your knee pops out, your foot, lower foot pops out, or he hits the elbow and your arm shoots straight. Those are looking at reflex arcs, which actually does not send, does not require information to go up to the brain, be processed, and then have a response. It is something that goes to the spinal cord and the spinal cord knows immediately how to respond. Obviously the information also goes up to the brain because you are aware of it happening, but the jerk happens so quickly and it's not, it doesn't, uh, does not rely on any brain processing to have that occur. All right, so we've talked about the creation of motor sequences, getting it from the secondary to the primary. Now we're gonna talk about how does that go from the primary to the brainstem, and then more importantly, how does the brainstem send that information down to the muscles? This is done through corticospinal tracts. So just like in somatosensory, there was a very specific track, and it helped you with its name by telling you where it went. This is called the corticospinal, meaning it starts in the cort uh, cortex or the brain, and it sends information down the spinal tract, by uh, the spinal cord, to the muscles. This. Corticospinal. There is the lateral and there's also the ventral. The lateral is responsible for controlling the digits in the extremities. Um, so looking, thinking about your legs and your hands and your arms. This is contralateral communication. So the right side of your brain controls the left side of your, your left hand, your left arm, and your left leg. Now the ventral corticospinal tract this is the one that stays on the same side. It's ipsilateral. And the muscles that are controlled in your midline are controlled by the same side. So your right side of your brain controls your right abs, your right back muscles, everything that's in the trunk of your body. So lateral is contralateral. It switches sides. And ventral is ipsilateral, or same side. So look at what that hit appears. So you've got all your information coming in from your primary motor cortex, all these different areas. You're going to have a, a concerted effort and orchestrated response. The information all converges into the brainstem here. The lateral corticospinal tract crosses over and then the information goes down while the ventral information stays on the same side and goes down. How does this work? The, cortico the corticospinal tract originates in the cortex and it terminates in the spinal cord. And at the spinal cord, it becomes, it interacts with interneurons, which then communicate to motor neurons. And motor neurons are what are responsible for getting the commands to the muscles. So the interneurons connect the spinal cord, the corticospinal tract, the end of that, to the motor neurons. And then motor neurons leave from there and communicate out to the muscles that they are related to. So fingers or hands are the most lateral while the arms and shoulders are intermediary. And then you've got the mid medial stuff, which is all the mid muscle control on the spinal cord. And we're gonna look at this in a picture so it makes more sense. So you have the information coming down, your different tracks. Here's your spi uh, ventral corticospinal tract. Here's your lateral corticospinal tract. So the information is coming down there and then it starts to feed information into here where the interneurons are, these purple, and they communicate with the motor neurons. The most lateral is the fingers, medial are arms and shoulders, and then your trunk is in the most medial. So intermediary, I apologize. Arms and shoulders are intermediary. Now we talk about muscles and we talk to discuss movement, right? So we talk about how we get the message to those areas. Now how do they actually work to allow for movement to occur? Well, there are two major types of muscles when we're talking about um, the ones that help us with movement, major movement, not stabilization, but major movement. Muscles work in pairs. Something that's true about muscles is they can only contract in one direction. They're not very flexible in that way. 
they can either contract or relax. Only two things a muscle can do. Therefore, for us to be able to move our bodies in multiple directions, which we can, we have to have muscles that work together. Extensors are muscles that move the limb away from the trunk of the body. Flexors, when they contract, the limb moves toward the body or the trunk of the body. So let's use your arm. If you put your shoulder out and your arm out straight in front of you, your hand is the furthest thing away from you right now. To get your hand to your shoulder, what muscle are you going to contract? You said your bicep, you're right. So your bicep is bringing your hand toward your trunk or toward your main part of your body. So your bicep is the flexor. Now to get your hand away from your shoulder, you're going to contract your triceps. They are extenders. So that's one pair. Another pair is your quadricep and your hamstring. Now think about your foot. When you are sitting and you extend your foot away from your body, which muscle is contracting? Your quadricep. So your quadricep is your extensor. If you want to bring your foot to your butt or back towards you, what are you contracting? Your hamstring. So your hamstring is your flexor. Another set are your abs and your back muscles. So when your back muscles are contracted, it pulls you upright or causes your back to arch. So it is an extender. The abs, when they're contracted, they pull everything together. So they're considered flexors. So again, they cannot, if both muscles contract at the same time, the limb will not move. They have to work in pairs. So when the bicep is contracted, the triceps relaxed. When the triceps contracted, the biceps relaxed. If you're going to have the movement or the directionality going on. Here's an example picture, just talk through everything I went that I was discussing. So your biceps is the flexor, your triceps the extensor. Acetylcholine is that neurotransmitter responsible for causing contraction. So if acetylcholine is present in the neuromuscular junction, that muscle fiber is going to become activated and it's going to start to contract. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about how the basal ganglia and the cerebellum help us have smooth, well-timed, and efficient movements. When our brain sends out these motor patterns, it actually sends multiple copies in different places. And it does this to help us adjust and correct. The basal ganglia receives input from the neocortex, the limbic system, and the motor cortex. And it is helping create a smooth integration of all the information. And then it sends it back to the motor cortex and the substantia nigra, which then may send corrections, may reinforce something. So the basal ganglia plays a, a really critical role. So here's the basal ganglion. There are multiple areas of the basal ganglia that play a role. So this is it from a outside view right here, this whole piece. Not that, that's the amygdala. But there are multiple pieces. So there's the caudate nucleus, there's the putamen, and then there's the um, globulus pedalis. These are all areas that receive information and they are processing the estimation about how close you are to where you want to actually be. And then it feeds that back to the brain. Oh, you got a little bit further. Oh, not there yet. You only have a partial, we're getting close. You know, there's all this back and forth about and helping with auto correction and those types of things. There are two major outcomes of damage to the basal ganglia when the basal ganglia is injured or starts to degenerate. So when the pod, uh, caudate putamen uh, is in some way damaged, there's often um, twitching um, and writhing, which is called dyskinesia. This is a hyperkinetic symptom. Huntington's shows this and so does Tourette's. Then there's hypokinetic, which is we see a loss in motor ability that often leads to rigidity and um, having in a, a hard time initiating and producing movement. So that's something that we see in Parkinson's. So the basal ganglia is highly involved in creating smooth, calm movements. The other big thing that the basal ganglia does is that it keeps the muscles and our body at a calmness or a rest. This is why when some of the advanced stages of Parkinson's, people become rigid and have a hard time initiating and move, making movements is because the muscles are tight and they're not in a relaxed state because the basal ganglia isn't keeping the system basically shut off. Now, these three videos are ones I'd really like you to go watch. It's a series of videos by a gentleman who had, who has Parkinson's and it was treated through deep brain stimulation. Parkinson's is a loss, is due to the loss of dopamine in the brain. We have learned that giving people L-DOPA is a strong, very strong, potent drug that works, but it also comes with a lot of negative side effects. And over time, it becomes ineffective. There are other therapies that people use. Marijuana has been a new one. Medicinal marijuana has been used. Um, and there appears to be certain types of marijuana that have a better 
effect on the basal ganglia and the motor control system. There are times when an individual lives long enough that the symptoms of Parkinson's is so severe and they are unable to take medication that they actually go in and they implant electrodes. A lot of people are familiar with pacemakers. It's where you have a, an electric leads put on your heart inside you and a little box that's implanted in you that is controlling the heartbeat or is present so that when you have an irregular or your heart stops, it will automatically cause a action potential in the heart so that your heart contracts. That's what a pacemaker does. So deep brain stimulation is a similar process where you have leads, electric leads placed into very specific areas of your brain. So for Parkinson's, it'd be placed in the basal ganglia area and a box is implanted in your chest and leads are directed towards it and it will releases of action potentials, elect electric currents that cause action potentials that allow dopamine to be released. So this gentleman shows you what he looks like on with the deep brain stimulator on versus not being on. He shows you a couple, maybe a year after having surgery, and then he shows you three years later. Uh, so it's a really neat video to watch if you've not seen anybody kind of go through this and um, and see how you know the advances in medical technology have really come along. Now it's important to understand that deep brain stimulation, they're starting to use it for other things, like depression and that type of stuff, but it's, it's, it's a high risk, it's surgery. I mean, you're implanting electrodes in a person's brain. Uh, so it's not highly used yet, like on a wide scale, but individuals who are really severe and it seems to be the only thing that's holding back our quality of life, they'll do that. Today is the 13th of November, 2010. One year ago, on this date, I was in the operating room at Stanford Medical Center for Deep Brain Stimulation Surgery, or DBS. An implanted pulse generator, or IPG, was surgically placed just below my right collarbone and is hardwired under the skin up to the two entry points at the top of my head. When it's on, the tremor is optimized. There's virtually no tremor in my right hand. By turning it off with the remote control, you'll see what my condition would be without the DBS. The first two attempts to push the correct button failed, but the third attempt worked. The stimulator is now off. Within seconds, you'll see the tremor return. My tremor is a resting tremor, which means when I initiate action with my right hand, the tremor dissipates. When the action stops, the tremor returns. Another visible symptom of Parkinson's is the inability to walk normally. With the stimulator turned off, my body is stiff and I shuffle when I walk. Turning around is difficult and my balance is poor. I don't dare try to hold a cup of hot coffee right now. I don't think you can see it, but close up you'll notice that my face has dropped significantly. I can really feel that at this point. I want to turn the IPG back on now, but I need to put it in my left hand. My right hand would be banging against my chest too much. Within seconds of switching it on, the tremor subsides and virtually disappears. I don't turn the stimulator off very often, but it is definitely an attitude check when I'm feeling frustrated or depressed. Thank God I live in a time for this kind of technology. Today is Sunday, it's October 7, almost three years since I had DBS.
Robin. Yeah. Can I give you a glass of water and a tea? Please tea. Bring the tea. Yeah, please. Dexterity is limited. Okay, I'm going to turn it back on now.
since turning the system back on, as you can see, my speech is better. Machine works. It's good. Now we're going to talk about the cerebellum and its two major roles is helping with timing and maintaining accuracy of our movement. This is where copies are sent also to the cerebellum to allow us to review what the message was sent to the intended movement was sent and then what the actual movement is and then making the adjust adjustments that we need to. So here's a picture that the cortex sends a copy of the message to this corticospinal tract, which sends it out to the spinal cord for delivery to the muscles but it also sends a copy to the inferior olives, which then sends it to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is receiving information from the actual movement, so the somatosensory area, to say, yeah, we got it right, or no, we didn't get it right, and it creates a correction, an error correction, and sends that information to the cortex, and that gets sent, and the cycle continues. So as I mentioned, when we drink, or if you have damage to your cerebellum, you lose the efficiency in the system, or maybe disappear completely um, for a period of time. If it's alcohol, it might be just a temporary reduction. But this causes, this change or this um, removal or decrease in the system is what causes movement to become erratic and or um, off when people are drinking. So again, the cortex sends the information to the spinal cord, but also sends a copy of cerebellum, where then information from the somatosensory is actually giving input to the brain to make sure you're getting where you need to. And if you're not getting where you need to, cerebellum sends an autocorrection to the, to the cortex who then processes that and allows the error to be fixed. At least hopefully it does before it's too late. Um, all right, and that is all I want to talk about on movement. Thanks.